Thank you. Thank you. I am very excited to be here today. Can you guys hear me OK up the back? Yes, that's good. OK, um, so yeah, my name is Zach Fitzwalter. It's great to be back at DevWorld. Like Tim, uh, I've been here now for a while, or been around for a while. I think 2010 was my first DevWorld. So it's great to be back. And yeah, this is what got me into iOS development and design. So it's a good conference to be at again presenting now. Um, so I am one half of a company called Eat More Pixels. We co-founded this company last year. The other half is Jimmy T. He's sitting right there. He is the technical lead, the technical wizard. And he's doing a presentation tomorrow uh, on Swift. Uh, so the talk is entitled Develop Swift and uh, Swiftly. And it's a talk about whether or not it's worth embracing Swift yet. So that would be a good one to look at. So we established it last year, and we've had a range of clients from various states since then. But before we did that, I was a lecturer at QUT, the Queensland University of Technology. Uh, and there I taught a number of subjects, video game design, and also one called gamification design. Um, and I did a PhD as well in this particular area of gamification. Um, and rather than get you to read the entire thesis, which is long and tedious, and no one really likes reading entire theses, um, I've started to put together a website called gamificationgeek.com, and today I've taken some of the elements of that thesis to present to you about designing, engaging, and motivating apps. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But that's enough about me. Let's talk about you, and in particular, all of the apps that you make. So specifically today, I want to talk about how to design engaging and motivating apps. And for this, there's a little bit of a formula that I have looked at using, and that is to focus on two things. The first is usability, and the second is psychology. So for our apps, it's good to have good usability because that will encourage people to use our apps in the first place, to have good utility so that the app should have something of value. But then to keep people using our applications, it's useful to go and have a look at some of the motivational psychology theories and see how we can apply this to our app design and to our development. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So it's this kind of, uh, this kind of picture in a nutshell. So how we can remove friction, so keep people, uh, continue to get people to use our app, and then use psychology to continue to get people to use our app. It, I almost got it. OK, so three things I want to uh, talk about. The first is how we can focus on usability to remove friction, so to get people using our apps in the first place. Then we're going to look a little bit at motivational psychology, which may seem weird for a developers conference, but it's interesting looking at some of the theories behind motivation, uh, why we do things, and how we can apply it to our own work as well. And then I'll finish up with a couple of good examples that may be useful for you uh, when you're de developing your own applications, and in particular, looking at a couple of scenarios where we can apply motivational design to help us. OK, so to begin with, let's look at usability. So what exactly is usability? Most of you should probably know what this is. It's an attribute that assesses how easy user interfaces are to use. And the user interfaces in our case are, are of course, the apps that we make. Now, good usability is a necessary condition for survival. And this is you know, uh, very important in particular on the App Store as well, because there are so many apps out there. People will stop using your app if your app is difficult to use, if it is unclear what value it offers people, and if it's really easy for people to get lost as well in your app. So if they open it up, they don't know how to use it, they're not sure what it offers exactly, and they get lost inside the app, then it's likely people will stop using your app altogether. The thing about good usability is that it should be invisible to the user. So it should be something which they don't see, which is frustrating as a usability designer because you put so much effort in to putting everything in the right spot, getting it pixel perfect, and then no one notices it whatsoever, which is super disappointing. But if the usability is bad, that's when people know it, notice it. Um, and boy, do they notice it. Um, this is one of my favorite examples of bad usability. This is a photo I took from a car park near me. And if you just look at that briefly for five seconds, try to work out how to use that ticket machine, that would be incredibly impressed. But it is a great example of absolutely poor, poor usability. Um, and you know that's when people will notice bad usability. They'll complain about it, and then they'll stop using your app altogether. And it's easy to forget about good usability. It's easy to get focused, in particular, on developing the app, getting the value there for the user. But then forgetting about usability uh, is something that can happen. And it can happen to the best of us as well. <laughs> 
Even Apple gets it wrong sometimes. I realize it does charge very quickly, but making something uh, completely unusable for that short amount of time was an interesting design choice. Okay, but in the app world, if your app has bad usability, then it's incredibly easy for users simply to stop using it, to jump on the app store and to find another app that they can start using. So the trick with usability is to start early within the design process. There's a number of uh, good usability goals that I like to refer to and use as a bit of a checklist when developing an app, and this comes from the good book, Interaction Design, Beyond Human Computer Interaction. Uh, and these particular goals are make sure your app is efficient to use, make sure it's effective to use, make sure it's safe to use, it has good utility, it's easy to learn, and easy to remember how to use. Let's talk about each of these briefly. So your app should be easy to learn. So with this, you should be asking the question, how easy is it for users to accomplish basic tasks? In particular, the first time that they open it and try to learn how to use your application. So your features of your app should be clear. It should be obvious what they are to the person who's using it. Um, and if your user skips the introduction, because they will skip your introduction, then they need to know how to use the app still. So one good piece of advice is to embed the tutorial into the app somehow. Just like video games do it. They often embed tutorials, or good video games embed tutorials into the game itself. Think about doing this with your app as well. So one of my favorite apps, Epic Win, it's a to-do list app, although it looks like a, a quest list from a video game. And this is great. I've seen a lot of to-do list apps do this, where they actually embed the tutorial into the actual app itself. So for this one, you know, it says complete a task by holding on the rosette. So you hold that down, it completes the task, press and hold on a task to drag it to a new position in that third screen there. And so it's actually teaching you with the actual interface of the app itself, rather than providing you know, six, seven, eight screens to introduce you to the functions of the app. So that's a great way to do it. Your app should be efficient to use as well. So by that we mean once users have learnt how to use the app initially, how quickly can they then perform tasks in the app? So it should be efficient to use. What's nice as well is if your app supports mastery, so after people have used it, if it includes things like shortcuts or gestures, ways in which people can master your app, it makes people feel really good. It feels like they're mastering something. So good examples of this are the Clear app and Tweetbot. Tweetbot in particular because you can change the interface to suit you, uh, you know, your particular style of interaction, and it has a number of shortcuts in there as well. A bad example would be doing any kind of text formatting in uh, an app. So for example, if we wanted to bold this particular text, the process behind doing that is quite difficult. So it may be worthwhile looking at using uh, some other shortcuts or gestures. Now Clear, one of my favorite apps, it uses gestures very well, and you feel like you've kind of mastered the app once you learn it. So it's actually a lot of fun to use this app, and you feel really good once you've you know, kind of mastered the gestures and how to use it. So that is the Clear app. And of course, you can also support 3D Touch in your app now these days. You just hold it down, and you can get to shortcuts really easily. And that's something that's quite easy to implement uh, in your actual applications these days. Next is easy to remember how to use your app. So when users return to your app after a long period of time, they finally come across it after they've reached the eighth page of their apps, and they're like, oh, yeah, I forgot I had this app there. Once they get back into it, can they easily remember how to use it again? So do you use standard controls or icons? That's always a great place to start. And is the tutorial easy to access again? So just having the tutorial again, for example, in the settings is a great way to uh, remind people how to use your app. Your app should be safe to use. So that means if someone messes up doing something, like trashing an email, for example, how can they recover from the errors in your app? So you know, it depends on what kind of errors they are. But if errors do occur, what ramifications are there? And can we get back to them or undo them easily? So this is one that took me a while to find out. But if you're in Apple email, you swipe across, you delete it, accidentally delete it. But if you shake it, which is a questionable design choice, but nonetheless, it is in there. If you shake it, then it will undo that particular delete. And then your app should be also effective to use. So that means you are able to perform the desired task effectively. Finally, your app should have some kind of good usability, uh, utility as well, which means it has some value, something that the person who downloads it uh, actually finds useful from it. So it should do something of importance for what the user needs, and it should address a particular problem that the user has. OK, a couple of tips and tricks when it comes to usability. It's good always to stick to defaults, especially if you're not a designer. Um, because Apple have this great array of default objects and interface design guidelines, 
They provide UI designs do's and don'ts, and they also provide a number of useful tips. And it's important to read up on the human interface guidelines that Apple provides as well. And if you stick to the defaults, then people are going to get it, because a lot of Apple apps use defaults, um, and a lot of other people use these defaults, so it's easily understandable how your app will work. Uh, and if you're designing for Android, it's completely different in terms of design. There are similarities, of course, but they also have guidelines, too, that are available for this particular platform. If you're a new developer, it can be easy to forget to learn about these defaults, but they can make a world of difference. However, not all suggestions are great, so take them with a grain of salt, because some of them, such as uh, embracing borderless buttons, may not be the best choice, because it can be difficult to differentiate between regular text and buttons. So, Take it with a grain of salt. If you are creating something different, something that stands out from the defaults or something that changes it a little bit, um, just make sure you do user testing before you release. This is incredibly important. I'm sure many of you know about user testing. Get hold of some representative users, not just your mum, not just your dad, not just your best friend, unless they are your representative users. Um, they, if you do get hold of those people, they'll either be too harsh or too nice to you. You want real feedback from actual representative users. And then get them to do representative tasks with the design itself. It's important to observe what your users do, where they succeed, and where they have difficulties with the interface. And the most important thing is just to let the users do the talking. It's easy to jump in and be like, oh, yeah, that part's not ready yet, or that shouldn't do that, or try to explain certain things about your app why it might not be working. And it can be really hard getting feedback from people as well. So it's important just to let them do the talking, to sit back and, and see what they have to say. OK, some useful tools before we move on to the next se section. I've started using Sketch. It's fantastic. Um, it's good for laying out the particular design, but it's really good because you can easily drop it into InDesign using some of the plugins that they have, and you can get that into users' hands as quickly as possible. Um, before that, I used Keynote, and there was a great presentation last year at DevWorld by Steph Sharp on using Keynote for uh, creating mock-ups and then getting it to the hands of people. Well worthwhile checking out. Uh, in the PhD, we used Lookback, or an earlier version of Lookback, and this records all kind of interaction with the screen, including touches, voice, and can get their reaction, uh, a person's reaction as well. It's very good. I haven't used it for a while since it's been rebranded, but it was useful back then. And I haven't used any of this particular type of service, but if you can't find representative users, you can get people to do online user testing for you. So you can use a service like user testing, or you can check out Amazon Mechanical Turk as well. OK, let's get into the fun stuff. Usability over. Let's talk about motivation. So uh, what exactly is motivation? Well, if we look at the definition for it, it's a reason or reasons for acting or behaving in a particular way. I think we all know what motivation is. But the, uh, if we look at it in, in, uh, in scientific terms, it's a theoretical construct used to explain our behavior. So it represents our reasons for desires, uh, actions, and needs. Now, motivation is actually a really important part of good design. So we want to encourage people to use our app to begin with. And there we can turn to psychology to help us understand some things that we can do. OK, so let's talk a little bit about motivation. Uh, there are considered to be two types of motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic. Extrinsic motivation, uh, on the left there, it describes the motivation to do something for an external reason. So there's some kind of reward that is encouraging us to do something, or we're getting punished for a particular behavior. The motivation is from an external point. It's from outside of us. But compared to intrinsic motivation, the other type of motivation, it is when an activity is performed for the internal satisfaction of that activity itself. So the motivation comes from within us. Now, if we talk about extrinsic motivation, we perform an action uh, in order to attain a desired outcome or avoid a negative one. The best way to think about this is to use the carrot and stick uh, metaphor. So uh, this kind of motivation can definitely work well to motivate us to do some things. And we've seen it in app design as well. So Foursquare is a great example of an app that used extrinsic motivation to encourage us to use it. So it was a fairly standard app in terms of what it provided uh, in terms of utility. So there are other apps out there at the time which allowed you to check into different locations. But what Foursquare did differently was it made it more game-like by adding these external rewards. So you, know, you could get points, you could get badges, you can compare yourself on a leaderboard. And these are still in Swarm today. They exist there. So you know, there is this kind of extrinsic reason. These rewards are a lot of the reasons that many of us might use this particular app, not just for the utility itself. 
Now, should we use rewards in apps? Well, they're not all that bad. So for routine tasks that aren't very interesting, for interactions that we might not find that interesting in our apps, rewards can be good to, to use to provide a small motivational boost. But there are disadvantages to relying on rewards alone, especially if you use them in something like an app. One disadvantage is that research has shown us that the uh, value of the reward diminishes over time. So you need to give people a bigger and bigger reward, generally, in order to keep motivating them. It can also undermine intrinsic motivation as well. So that if someone is intrinsically motivated to undertake an activity, use your app, and you add rewards to it, then it may undermine that initial intrinsic motivation. So if we talk about intrinsic motivation now, it's when we talk about someone who is motivated uh, for the internal satisfaction of a task itself. So if you sit down to read a good book, you're not doing it because you're getting pizza vouchers, because you're not in year three when they had that pizza voucher. You remember, anyone remember that? You got free pizzas for how many books you read back in high school or primary school? That was something. So that's a good example of extrinsic motivation. But intrinsic motivation is if you sit down and read the book itself just because you're enjoying the book, right? Um, and uh, you know, we see it, for example, when you're reading books, when you're playing games is another great example of when someone can be intrinsically motivated. And the advantage of being intrinsically motivated is that this type of behavior can be long-lasting, self-sustaining, and fulfilling, which is great. However, fostering this type of motivation is difficult. You need the right set of conditions. So what makes something intrinsically motivating? Well, researchers, Ryan, DC, and others, believe that activities are primarily motivating to the extent that people experience three things uh, while doing it. Autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And these are three basic psychological needs that, as human beings, they allow, us, uh, for, op they allow uh, for optimal function and growth as human beings. Basically, if we support these three things in our everyday lives, it makes us happy as human beings. So this particular theory in research is known as self-determination theory. It is a theory of motivation that suggests that people tend to be driven by a need to grow and to gain fulfillment. So let's talk about these three things briefly. Autonomy is basically, it, it talks about the choices that we make as human beings. So if we have the ability to make our own choices rather than do it because we're being rewarded or punished, then our sense of autonomy is quite high. So that is you know, having uh, the ability to make our own choices in life. The next is competence. So that is we are given a challenge uh, that matches our skill level, something that isn't too difficult and something that isn't too easy. And the third is relatedness. So that is uh, a person's connection to and support from everyone around us. So if we can support these three things, it encourages an incredibly high quality form of motivation. Now, one other useful uh, uh, theory to talk about is the theory of flow. And the theory of flow talks about when we are in a state of full immersion in a particular activity that we're undertaken. And we often see this in people who play video games. So I could probably walk up to this guy, I could wave my hand in front of him, and he would just not even notice that I was there because he's in this state of flow playing video games. What's interesting about being in a state of flow is that you often experience many things. So you have an intense and focused concentration, a great sense of control over your activity, and something else that's really interesting that happens is you get this distortion of time effect. So that's when you sit down, it's 11 o'clock at night, you're like, okay, I'm just gonna go play games for five minutes, it'll be totally fine, I'll wake up early, whatever, it's all good. And then six hours later, you're still playing the video game and you, you don't realize that that time has passed. It feels like no time has passed whatsoever. If you've been in that particular state, then it's likely that you've been in a flow state, so when you've had this distortion of time. Now, to reach this particular state, you need to support a number of things. So you need to have generally a clear goal that you're working towards, clear progress towards completing that goal, clear and immediate feedback to tell you how you're going, and again, this balance of challenge and skill, which is shown quite nicely in this particular graph. So you know, you're in a flow state if you manage to have a, a, a challenge which matches your particular skill. If your skills are too high, the challenge is too low, then you're going to feel bored, and if the challenge is too high and the skills are too low, you're going to feel anxious then. Okay, that's probably enough motivational design, uh, motivational theory for one afternoon. How does this apply to app development? 
Okay, well, how can we use this? We can look at these two particular things to help us when we design our apps. We can look at usability and usability goals to help us remove friction, and we can look at these psychological constructs and the motivational theories to help us increase motivation. So what's quite useful is when we're designing apps is to use this particular one as a checklist to make sure that we're ticking these off as we design it, and then using these as lenses, again, kind of in a way like a checklist to say, yes, have we, you know, if we're supporting or trying to support intrinsic motivation first of all, because we want to do that, then how can we support, you know, self-determination theory and flow theory? And if we can't support intrinsic motivation or the task is boring, how can we use extrinsic motivation to encourage people to use our app? So what I want to do is I want to look at some common examples that you may come across as app developers and app designers. First up, how can we encourage users to use your app? Okay, well, I'm going to give you a, num a number of different possible solutions. None of these may be correct or not, but they're just ways which you can think about applying this particular usability and motivational theory to these apps. So you could offer discounts and free trials. This is an example of extrinsic motivation, which is used in a lot of different apps and services, where, for example, you get a first month or a first week free, you give your credit card details, and then they start charging you a month later. And by then, sunk cost fallacy kicks in. You're like, yeah, of course, I love this service now. Why would I not if I was uh, not paying for it? And so then you can motivate people potentially through extrinsic motivation to sign up and start using your service. Referrals are another way to encourage people to use your app. So this is something that Airbnb and Uber use quite effectively. And that is to give out uh, a particular code to your user, which if they give to someone else, they get some kind of uh, discount or some kind of credit, and your friend gets some kind of discount and credit as well. Now, the thing about this is, yes, it's an extrinsic motivator because you get something in return. You might be doing it because you're motivated to get the credit. But at the same time, it does support relatedness in the sense that you are helping a friend out and giving a discount to your friend is always, you know, creates kind of a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. If we want to encourage users to try to use our existing, uh, to try and use our app, then it's important to make sure they can do it as quickly as possible as well. So what's quite useful is uh, allowing people to skip sign up or introduction in your app as well. So this will turn a lot of people off if they reach your particular app and they have to sign up to your app to use it uh, before they can actually start using it. So this is a great example. By just providing uh, a demo of the app that they can click to check it out, see what's involved, that is useful uh, in order to give them kind of a taste of what it is. So just, you know, it supports uh, autonomy quite nicely because they can try it out, and it's also quite useful because it's effective in the sense that, you know, they don't have to sign up, log in to start using your app already. You can support different types of users as well. So, for example, if your app needs a particular piece of hardware or needs to be used in a particular location, what you can do is you can offer alternatives. So an app that we made for the State Library of Queensland, it could only be used at the State Library of Queensland. But what we did was we included an example that anyone could use anywhere in the world, just so you can get a taste of it, and then that would kind of, you know, give you a sense of what it was like and potentially encourage you to come to the library to try the app. Finally, in this particular uh, area, encouraging users to use your app, it's a, a really easy way is to, to support sharing as well in your app. So just have the ability to share the content that your app provides. And this is something which can be added quite easily. Um, and it's nice because it supports relatedness and allows you to share you know, something that you find quite meaningful for you. So I love this podcast app. It's fantastic, Overcast. It's got some really nice design elements to it. Um, and this is great because you can share the episode, but not only that, you can share it at current time as well. So it uses kind of these context-aware cues in order to help you share things which may be useful at that particular time. Luckily, Apple makes it incredibly easy to add sharing sheets, and here's a great link to get an overview of how to set this up. Next up, how can we nudge users to sign up for our app or provide information? Uh, so we can, again, support as many different types of ways to sign up. So supporting autonomy, again, making it efficient to use. It's a pain in the butt having to sign up for every single service or app that you download. And so what's nice is if you support alternate ways in which people can sign up. And again, this can be quite easy to do if you're using something like Facebook or Twitter, something that many people might use already. We can also make the sign-up process easy to use as well. So rather than just having text input, which people have to enter, 
you know, have the input field ready to go. If you're using just numbers only to input, show the number pad. And if you can, use images as well, because images are just much easier to recognize and to use. Uh, during the sign-up phase, we can also encourage users to provide information by giving them clear goals, progress, and feedback. And I love this example. Some, some people don't. But this is the sign-up uh, kind of uh, profile tool for LinkedIn. And what's nice about it is it's not just a step-by-step -step process where you have to provide information. It shows you exactly how far you are to completing your profile on LinkedIn. It gives you clear goals. It gives you a sense of autonomy because you can choose what task you tackle next. It gives you clear feedback as to how that will go to completing your goal. And it gives you some purpose as well, like why you need to do that. So you click the link, it tells you. I love that one. And then to keep users using our app, what can we do? Well, this may be a little bit obvious, but if your app provides good utility, something that is actually useful for people, then that's a good starting point, especially if it offers something else that no one does. Uh, if you don't, then maybe you could look at using extrinsic elements to keep users coming back. So, for example, you could provide a daily reward. But whether this does continue to encourage people to use your app over time depends on how well it's designed. What about encouraging users to rate your app? This is always something that many of us may struggle with, just encouraging people to put a, a rating up on the App Store. Well, the first thing you don't do is you don't interrupt them immediately as they download the app. So this is probably the worst time in which you could ask someone for an app before they've even started, uh, an app review, before they've even started using your app. Don't interrupt customers in the middle of tasks or at app launch. I love, so these are some great examples of when to add potentially good reviews. So if you prompt the customer at some point while the app is running, you're always going to disrupt their workflow to some degree. But you can alleviate this by picking a moment that is least disruptive to the user. So for example, when something positive happens, like you clear all of your tasks in this particular app, that's a great place of doing that. You can also provide a rate this app button in the settings or the about page. So you know, but they, this, the user then has to find that particular button in order to do it. And while this method is not as effective as prompting, uh, it does negate the need to ever pester the user. Uh, so that, you know, from the user's perspective, is a great option. One of the downsides this, of this particular route, though, is that you only generally get people who want to complain about your app or who want to say something really nice about your app. So you could do this instead, which is a nice kind of alternative, where you go to provide feedback, uh, and this is in the Ember app by RealMax Software. And instead of going straight to the App Store, they try to capture how you're feeling to begin with. If you're feeling happy, you can then leave feedback. If you're feeling confused, you can get in touch with them directly. And if you're unhappy, the same thing. So it's trying to stop people from leaving negative reviews, but also allow you to do something which the App Store doesn't allow you to do, and that is respond to reviews. Another great example, a good sense of relatedness in the Overcast app. Uh, he puts the number of people who have actually rated this version in there. And he says, only 39 people have done this. Unless it's a bigger number, then it's like 75 people have rated this. So it's just kind of a little bit of relatedness in there, which is quite nice. You can see or you can contribute to the ratings with everyone else. OK, there's some great posts there. So that's basically what I wanted to touch upon today, some examples. Um, look at using the usability goals, and then also those motivational elements as well in your app design. And you may have a better chance of making a more engaging and motivational app. So the takeaways are, look at the usability goals, turn and have a look at some of those theories of motivation, and see how we can apply them to app design. If there's one book that I can recommend, it is this one, Seductive Interaction Design by Steven Anderson. It's fantastic. Uh, all the slides and resources from today's presentation are there. Gamificationgeek.com forward slash devworld16. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, cool. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? No. Yeah. Do you think gamification is on the rise or on the wane? The word gamification or the concept? I guess the word, or both but the concept as well. Where's Paris? Paris doesn't like the word gamification. He's not here. OK, great. So gamification um, <laughs> is, I think it's interesting. It's good. It's a good term because people are talking about it. But the way in which people are applying it is kind of incorrect to a certain extent because it's focusing on rewards only. 
Um, but if you look at games, video games, they're not engaging just because of the rewards. The rewards are one part of it. What makes games engaging are the, the challenges that it, it provides people. Um, so a lot of the gamification examples these days don't have that challenge aspect or they don't really focus on the motivating aspects of games. They turn straight to extrinsic motivation. Um, and if we do that, it's a different type of motivation. In terms of gamification, people have proposed different terms like gameful design. But it comes down, I think it's all just good motivation design is what it is. Um, so gamification will probably cease, stop existing in five, 10 years potentially, and we'll just focus on motivational design is what it, what it really should be called. Or serious games is the other, but that's another area as well. Cool, if anyone has any questions after, come talk to me. Or if you just want to talk about awesome video games that you like, I'm happy to talk about that as well. Cool.